I want to start out reading about prayer, how Jesus began talking about prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, he starts out talking about prayer this way. He said, and when you pray, Matthew, actually chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. He said, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty words, empty phrases like the Gentiles do, who think that they will be heard because of their many words. You must not be like them. For your heavenly Father knows what you need even before you ask him. And then he goes on to say, when you pray, pray like this. And he goes into the Lord's Prayer. Now, why would Jesus talk about how not to pray before he talks about how to pray? Imagine people were praying that way. And what would Jesus know about prayer? He's probably 30, 30, 31 years old at this time. He has an interest in prayer. Most of us see him as a 31-year-old, 32-year-old. What was he doing before those 31 years? Where was he? What was he doing? And what is he doing after those 33 years he was on this earth? I think he has a very big interest in prayer. I would imagine he spent a lot of time listening to prayers. He says things like, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's very, very close to the Father who is listening to a lot of prayers. It's very clear from what he's saying here that not all of the prayers are sweet incense to him. So we want to take note of that. Hypocrites, by the way, love to pray. Hypocrites love to pray. So how can we not be like them? Well, there's something that the hypocrites are doing and that these Gentiles are doing that he wants to warn us about. First of all, they love to pray publicly. They love to be seen praying. He's contrasting that by saying, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Is your public prayer different than your private prayer? Are your public prayers longer than your private prayers? If they are, let's make a note. Let's make a note. Because we know something about the brain that gets engaged when there's public prayer. When you're in a prayer group and it's your turn to pray, and people's eyes are on you, it's a chemical called dopamine that's released into the brain and you actually like it. And so it's very possible that you go on longer than the attention spans of the people around you. I don't think I'm the only one that has noticed that. And I want to caution you. I've never heard anyone else speak on this, but I just, as someone who knows about the brain and knows about people and knows about the word of God and what he wants, it's very, very easy for us, very understandable that you would go on 
longer than the attention spans of the people listening to you. The goal of you praying publicly, I would imagine, would be to get agreement where two or three are gathered and agree, I will do it for them. We have promises like that in the scripture. So we want to make sure that if we're praying publicly, one of the main reasons is so people can agree with us. If you go on longer than people can agree with you, I don't know that you're doing them or yourself, or maybe not even God, a favor. Those can be done privately. Just suggesting no hard and fast rules here, but I want to bring something to your attention that obviously Jesus, before he tells them how to pray, he tells them how not to pray. And the dopamine that's in your brain from when you're praying publicly may not be working in your favor. I suggest people pray for about a minute. After about a minute, people's attention spans tends to go down, 30 seconds to a minute. If you're praying for somebody, you actually laid your hands on them, people typically freeze. And it's very difficult to hold that position for longer than 30 seconds or a minute. Think about what you're going to say, and then say it, and then you can be quiet. And if it's a group, you can go around as many times as you want, but you can keep your prayers shorter. You can get the agreement you want in the group, and you can do everyone a favor as far as their attention span. I think Jesus is talking about people that don't know God. They don't have a relationship with God. The Gentiles, he would be speaking about people who are outside what he would consider the family of God. They don't know him. They're just piling on words, hoping that they'll get some reaction. He wants a relationship. So now let's talk about what God does want. You're going to go into your room and you're going to shut the door. The one thing that we don't see the hypocrites doing or the Gentiles doing, we hear a lot of talking going on, but what don't we hear? Listening. They're not listening. If this is a relationship, there has to be talking and listening. Well, if we're going to listen to God, I mean, does he want to speak to us? What evidence do we have that he wants to speak to us, that we can rely that if we're going to listen to him, he's going to speak, that we can... We can spend the time listening because listening is harder than talking. Listening is much harder than talking. And if we talk about the way the brain works, listening or speaking to someone you can't see is much more difficult than speaking to someone you can see. So if you're having more trouble praying than you are talking on the phone or texting your friends, it's no wonder. It is more involved. You, it takes more energy for you to be able to communicate with someone you can't see. You need to give yourself some grace with that, but you also need to rise to the occasion. This is a relationship that's worth it, and I'm going to spend the time to communicate with someone I can't see. That being said, it's also difficult to listen to someone you can't see. You can't see their expression. You can't see, are they glad to be with me? That's why we typically talk to a, a person. And listening prayer certainly can be done in groups. I'm going to read a couple of verses that address this idea. Does God, does Jesus, does the Father want to speak to you? Out of John chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, he's talking about his sheep. He says, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, for they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. 
One of the big questions people ask is, if I'm listening to God, how do I know it's his voice? You will know. My sheep hear my voice. If you are in the family of God, if you have received Jesus as your Savior, forgiveness of your sins, you've been born from above or born again, Jesus lives in you, you are one of his sheep, and you will hear his voice. You will recognize his voice, and you will also, he says, recognize the voice of the evil one who is going to try to speak to you. He's trying to speak to you all the time. You have competing voices. A little farther down, in John chapter 10, verse 27, again, Jesus picks up this theme, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So we're listening for his voice so that we can follow him. Another verse, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. One of my favorite verses. And when you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Isaiah 30, verse 21. When you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. So God wants to communicate with us. He wants to lead us. He wants us to follow him. My receiver needs to be tuned to his frequency. There are radio waves, television waves all through this room. No one has a radio on. We can't pick them up. We want to be tuned into his frequency. He's communicating with us, and we want to get our receiver tuned. And there are certain things that block the reception of God's voice. One of the things that we want to make sure is that the things that we're hearing line up with Scripture. We don't want to be hearing things that go against the written word of God. That's, that's a safeguard for us. We want to be very cognizant of that. If you're getting something that goes against the word of God and someone mentions that, you really want to look closely at that. Listening prayer is one of the things that my wife and I do regularly. I would say it's really a pillar of our marriage. In fact, when, it, when a decision or an invitation for me to speak comes in, whether I want to do it or not, I always tell the person, I'll have to get back with you. And then my wife and I will do listening prayer. Why? I want to be a good steward of my time, my talents, and not just every time uh, I, I get a phone call, I up and run uh, because I get dopamine because, as I just mentioned, people are listening to me. Make sure this is God's voice. This is God's direction. This is where he wants me to speak. Financial situations. We've all got those coming, coming in. Oh, don't miss this offer. Don't miss this chance. Last chance to uh, get on board with this program. We take those financial things to God and we do listening prayer. No matter how big it is, no matter what the opportunity may be, the fear of missing out, FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, we're all afraid of missing out. Listening prayer is one of the things you can use to put a check on that fear of missing out. Is this really God? Because you can be chasing other people's dreams for you and wasting a tremendous amount of time. If we get our roots deep, if we spend time with him, the opportunities will come up in his timing and with his blessing. A woman recently contacted me and wanted to spend some time on the phone with me. She asked, 
I'm interested in the spiritual things. I like what you're talking about. How can I know more? And I said, I recommend you start reading the Bible. Start with the book of John. Start with Matthew. Whatever you feel you need to know who Jesus is and what you're getting into. Pray before you read. Write down any questions you have, but start with the word of God. So she read the book of John. She had a, a, a tremendous experience with that. She then said, I, I want Jesus to be my Savior. And then as she was going through Matthew, her relationship broke up. She was in a relationship uh, with a man who did not have faith in God. She said, I tried that. I don't want that. That's not for me. So she called me. She called me and she was crying. She was upset about this relationship breaking up. There were some things about it that felt a bit like a betrayal to her. And I was comforting her, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, that must be really, really hard. But when I comfort people, I want to make sure that it's not just me comforting them. I actually want God to comfort them. So my next question to her was this. I wonder if Jesus knows how you feel. Why don't we ask him? And she said, well, how do I know what I'm hearing is the voice of Jesus? I said, well, what do you hear? She said, the I heard yes. I understand how you feel. I said, well, that lines up with Scripture. You've just read the book of John. Does Jesus know anything about betrayal? Oh, yes, she said. I think Judas, Judas betrayed him, and, and Peter, Peter too. I said, yeah, yeah. He knows about betrayal. So he can validate the feeling you're having. Now let's ask him this question. Does he have anything he wants to say to you now? Let's just listen. And again, she said, well, how, how do I know they're not just my, my thoughts? I said, well, what did he say? He said, I will never leave you or, or forsake you. I am always with you. You know, she hasn't gotten to Hebrews yet where those words are written. I said, that, that's him. That's him. You know, he sounds like your voice. He sounds like your thoughts. It's how he communicates to you, but you have to learn to recognize that's him. You are hearing the voice of God. He's very personal, and he's speaking to you. He is speaking to you. And then she went on that, that night and kept reading. I think she was in Mark and started reading, and she, she texted me a verse. She said, this verse speaks to me. I think he's still speaking to me. <laughs> And I said, yes, he is. He's always speaking to us. A couple of things to differentiate between God's voice, our voice, the voice of the evil one. How do we differentiate? A couple of things. Character. What's the character of this voice saying, doing? It's something that's appealing to your pride, something appealing to your, your sense of vengeance to get back at someone. Or is it appealing, is it even a thought that maybe you wouldn't have even had, something very noble, something that when you hear it, it gives you a peace. There's something very peaceful about it. Not, you better do this quick, you got to go. He's not a slave driver. Glamour, popularity, fame, fortune, quick decisions, don't miss it. Appealing to your pride, that would be the voice of the evil one. Someone who's trying to build a relationship with you or help build your relationships with other people, like having you talk to them, apologize to them, 
bless them, pray for them. That would be the voice of God. So what are some things that really block us? We're all here to hear the voice of God. Everyone wants to hear the voice of God. Why don't some people hear? One of the things is unconfessed, unrepentant sin. If you can imagine your child, you told them not to do something and they did it. You told them not to eat the cookie, they ate the cookie. You said that they're not going to be able to have cookies at after dinner if they eat the if they eat the cookie. And the child basically says, It's not my fault, not my problem. And runs away in their room and slams the door. Now you want to communicate with them, you want to comfort them. You actually want to be close to them, but there's a block. Your child who has unconfessed, unrepentant sin or disobedience, it's very difficult to comfort that child. You can try. The child actually would like you to comfort them, just give them what they want. I want you to think of how it would be as a parent, how difficult it is to comfort a disobedient child who is unrepentant. And as we look to God to say, God, I want to hear your voice. I'm listening to you. If there's unconfessed, unrepentant sin, it's very difficult to hear the voice of God. Often because he told us to do something or not to do something, and we've been disobedient, and we've never made that right. And it could be years and years ago. We knew we shouldn't do it. We did it a relationship, a financial thing, a job, or whatever. We shouldn't go to that movie, that party. We went, and we've never come clean about that, saying, God, you know, you told me not to go. I went. It took me a week to recover. I'm sorry. You were right. And when I decided to go, I actually quenched the Holy Spirit. Very serious. We say, oh, I went to a movie. No big deal. If you were involved in quenching the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was trying to speak to your heart in a sensitive way, and you said, you know, I'm not listening. That would be something you want to make right. That would be something, very low-hanging fruit, to hear the voice of God, to say, God, I was wrong. I remember that time. I remember that episode, and I'm here to say I'm sorry. I confess my sin. You're faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. First thing to do. Second thing, lack of faith. Sometimes we just doubt we can hear from God. Other people hear from God, super spiritual people, but I don't. That may be something you want to say right now. I've read the verses, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And maybe you can say, I want to hear your voice, God. Maybe let's say that together. I want to hear your voice, God. I am your sheep and I will hear your voice. Some other things. Pride. Your smartphone, your cellular phone, probably has something to do with difficulty hearing God. We know that the just being able to see the phone or being on your person, or any time that it may go off with a ding and interrupt your focus on God. Remember, you're focusing on someone you can't see now. And all of a sudden, you have heard a sound that you can hear. And you can see, and there it is, the banner. Oh, I've been waiting for this text. And where is your mind gone? It's rude enough with another person. Is it possible that this, this is actually rude to keep your phone on the table when you're trying to listen to God. We know from the research, 10%, we know that 10% of your intelligence drops if you can see your phone.
Because in the background, you're thinking, at any time, the call, the text, it could come in, and you have a divided allegiance. Put the phone away. Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord in that. One of the blocks to hearing God is something that you are invested in, whether it's a relationship, very, very common. I insist that this relationship must work with this person. And you are not really open to hearing God steer you away from that. Anytime we're invested, anytime it has to work out this way, harder, not impossible, but much harder to hear from God. He may actually have to bring someone else along that would tell, give you that message, someone who loves you, but you may not hear it directly from him, but he has other ways to get it to you. And one of the reasons that my wife and I do listing prayer is if I'm invested in something or I want to make this financial decision, I am a risk taker. She would be able to say, you know, I don't think that's the right way. Ultimately, if she says no, I listen to that, especially when I'm invested and it's something that I want. I have to be able to listen to someone else to hear for me because I know that my ears are not necessarily open to the voice of God in that issue. It's very difficult to hear the voice of God in an area that you really want. Which brings me to this verse that Jesus speaks in Matthew 13, 13. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. Hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they can barely see. We are so used to looking at screens, electronic screens, that our eyes have grown dull to seeing in the spiritual realm. You know, you have five physical senses. You also have five spiritual senses. I don't know if you recognize that. Jesus is, obviously these people can hear. They're not, they're not all going deaf. They're not all getting hearing aids. They can hear, but he's saying you're not hearing spiritually anything. Your ears are dull. In the Hebrew, the word is fat. Their heart has grown fat. Fat in that culture has something to do with riches. And here we are in the, in the United States. Fatness, riches, movies, videos. What are you filling your mind, your heart, your imagination with? Has your heart grown dull? So we want to tonight start opening up this avenue, seeing with our spiritual eyes, hearing with our spiritual ears. There's also evidence in the scripture that people have eaten the scroll you can taste in the spiritual realm, sweet and then bitter. There's smells of incense in heaven. Touch, taste, smell. All the five senses are available in the spiritual realm if you're interested. But from what Jesus is saying, not everybody gets there. Not everybody wants it. Not everybody is willing to do the work. So I'm going to stop right there because we're going to do our first exercise now. And the first exercise, the first exercise is going to be, we're going to remove any blocks. So you can take your little list and I'm going to give you a few minutes. So before we get into actually listing prayer, I want you to spend some time with God praying over any potential blocks going through your history and just doing some business with him. I'm going to give you three or four minutes right now. Okay, I, I do want to touch on unforgiveness really quickly. 
it's probably more than we can handle in this this class is not about forgiveness but just to to look at that because it's such a serious problem in our lives and can really hold back hold, hold back the blessings of God for us one of the things that that I use is is just to remember just to focus on what it cost God sending his son what it cost Jesus to to pay for your sins, to die for you. Focus on that. Focus on what it cost him. Focus on how important the relationship was. Fill up with that. Fill up with God's goodness, his blessing over you, his love for you. And when we look at someone who owes us something, we don't want to be coming from lack. When we come from lack, we, we move into sin very easily. But when we come from fullness, we can easily or more easily forgive. Forgiveness is difficult, very, very difficult. But it is what God calls us to if we want to be like him. To focus on what he's done for you, because most of the time when we are in unforgiveness, we're very focused on what that other person has done to us and how they should be punished. If you focus on what God's done for you, it is easier to forgive. And forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. Forgiveness is just saying, I set them free. I cancel their debt to me. They don't owe me anything. They don't owe me an apology. They don't have to pay me back. We're looking to that person to get the respect that they took. Often these are people that are close to us. They are the ones that hurt us. And when they disrespected us or devalued us, we actually feel like our value has dropped. And we're insisting that we get our value from them and that they admit that we have value. And it's probably never going to happen. So we need to get our value from God, recognize that people are welcome to love us and they are welcome to dismiss us. They are welcome to reject us. God will never reject you. But other people, they rejected Jesus and Jesus told them, if they're going to treat me this way, they're going to treat you this way. Take it to the Lord, but forgiveness, very, very important to work through. I want to read this passage out of 1 Kings 19. Elijah killed 400 prophets of Baal, but now he's on the run. Jezebel wants to kill him. He's depressed. He's angry. He's angry with God. He runs and runs and runs all the way from the middle of Israel all the way, way to the south of Israel. He goes on a mountain, and the Lord meets him. And I want to read this passage. God says, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountain and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Still small voice. We're expecting God to write it in the clouds. but We're listening to a still small voice. And with that, I want to do the first exercise. The first listening prayer exercise, we're going to start with a passage of Scripture. Often we will do this, and I recommend also if there's a passage of Scripture you don't understand or you would like to understand more fully, you take it before the Lord and you listen to him regarding this passage. Now, what I don't want you to do is write on your paper a sermon you heard about this passage. 
or something you read from a commentary or your great academic wisdom regarding this passage. I want you to see if the Lord will reveal to you something about this passage that's fresh for you, for this moment, for your relationship with him. Some of you at the table are going to start writing immediately. Some of you are not. You're going to just have a blank. I want During this exercise, it's very important to be able to wait. You may not get anything until the last minute. And if that's you, that's okay. This is, there's no pressure. If you are the only one at the table that didn't get something, listen to what the other people got. I want you to write something that comes to mind for you, even if you're not sure if that is God speaking to you. I want you to get it on the paper, and then I want you to talk to the people at your table about it afterwards. We're learning. We're all learners here. That's why we've come. This is about you trying to learn. It's like learning a new language. You need to be able to make mistakes. But here's the passage we're starting with. John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. I want you to even imagine Jesus, he's he's standing here, he's saying this to you personally. I'm the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is, she it is, that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5, I'm going to give you seven minutes or so now, just of silence. I'm going to pray now. Father, I just pray protection. We don't want to hear any voices from the evil one. We only want to hear your voice. We've come here tonight expectantly, excitedly, enthusiastically. We've taken our time. We've taken our energy to hear your voice, and we are confident that you want to speak to us. I ask protection for our minds, protection for this place, and a blessing on each one to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen.